Ladies and gentlemen, I enjoy giving speeches. I've been doing it for years. First and second year university, when all my mates were fornicating their way across Australia going to the AMSA convention. <laughs> Do you know what I was doing? I was at InterVarsity debating tournaments. That's right, ladies and gentlemen, debating my way through the July holidays of 1996 and 1997. Not a lot of fornication happening there, my friends. <laughs> Then I went to convention in Sydney in 1998. My university debating career came to an abrupt halt and I never looked back, but I still like to talk. What I don't like doing so much is writing the speeches and that's because I'm a procrastinator and I procrastinated like nothing else over this one. And when you procrastinate these days with high speed internet and Wikipedia and everything like that, you can get a little bit lost. And when you get lost in the internet and you jump from topic to topic and page to page, you can find yourself in some pretty interesting places. And pretty soon you're looking at the Wikipedia page on the Kama Sutra. Let me tell you a little bit about what I found out. I found out 64 interesting things about the Kama Sutra, along with 64 very interesting positions, uh, pictures I should say. I found out a 65th interesting thing, and that is that the Kama Sutra was, according to some historians, written by the celibate monk Vatsyayanas. Celibate. If you've ever used that book, it makes a weird sort of sense. <laughs> Apart from thinking that Vatsyayanas was either an incredible visionary or one of history's greatest voyeurs, it really did make me think that in order to write the book on something, you should have a degree of experience in it. And understanding global health, I think, is no exception. So I challenge myself today, ladies and gentlemen, to take you through global health in a way as wide-ranging and gymnastically challenging as the Kama Sutra itself. <laughs> I was a senior resident medical officer at Royal North Shore Hospital when I first climbed the stairs to the office of Médecins Sans Frontières Australia. I was backing my high school French skills after a decade out of school. The interviewer asked if I spoke French. I said, oui. <laughs> she asked in French what I uh, had eaten for breakfast, and I don't know the French translation for wheat bix so I said, un croissant. <laughs> a lesson for young players. Medicine mostly, but humanitarian medicine in particular is a bad place to overstate one's ability. And a fortnight later, I accepted my invitation to my first mission in the French Congo in a very small village in the north of the country called Betu. The parting piece of advice from the MSF Human Resource Coordinator as I left the office, speak French, make sure you speak French, they think you're a French speaker. So you get the picture. And like most non-native speakers of a language, I was better at reading and writing than speaking and listening. So I was pretty sure that I understood the written briefing pack, even though it was written in French. Um, civil war in the early 2000s, a devastated but rebuilding capital, measles epidemic in the far north of the country, which was the reason why MSF was there in the first place. All except for a word that I didn't recognise, pirogue, wasn't in the French English dictionary. From what I could tell, you'd travel from Paris to Brazzaville, get a local flight into a place called Infondo, and then travel by pirogue to Betou. Now, Betu on the map was a long, long way from Infondo, and if you can imagine closing your eyes and sticking your finger in the middle of the African continent, that's pretty much where Betu is. Clearly, pirogue was local slang for a single-engine Cessna. I was wrong. The closest translation is dugout canoe. So 72 hours later, after leaving Sydney with whirlwind briefings in Paris, Brazzaville, entering this completely unfamiliar context, I found that the mission to Betu was a 12-hour journey via dugout up the Obongi River, one of the major tributaries of the mighty Congo River system. Now, I'm going to have to assume a little bit of literary or cinematic knowledge here, and apologies to those who haven't read Joseph Conrad's Heart of Darkness, famously remade into Francis Ford Coppola's film Apocalypse Now. But I have to tell you, I was in this story. I'm setting off on this 12-hour canoe ride up the river, a dawn, jungle, mist rising off the river, villages sort of passing dimly. I'm there after a 72-hour journey from Sydney via Paris and Brazzaville. I'd just broken up with my girlfriend, um, who is now my wife. Um, 
I was dozing off into a funk of mefloquine induced hallucination. I felt quite literally like Marlow, like Conrad's character Marlow. And in the late evening when we arrived, I was greeted by this five foot tall, tall bipolar field coordinator from Chile who, who I thought was playing the character the Harlequin. But then I met the field doctor and he was this bald, bespectacled, acne-ridden RMO from Belgium um, who, like Kurtz, has shacked up with a statuesque Congolese midwife and was planning on bringing her home to the old country. Um, and as I stepped off that canoe, I had the blinding flash of realisation amidst everything else that was going on that I still couldn't speak French. Language, ladies and gentlemen, in particular the ability to speak one's own native language is something that we take substantively for granted in this country. But practising medicine in a foreign tongue, unaware of the subtleties or the colloquialisms, let alone the medical terms, was as challenging an experience as I've ever had. Let me take you forward a couple of months as I write the transfer letter for a young child with glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase um, deficiency. I write it in French with the only thing helping me, a copy of Harrison's Principles of Internal Medicine, also written in French, the sort of nightmare you might have before your physician's exam. It took me three days to write that letter and I became, after a fashion, a French speaker. When I then landed in Chad on my second mission, I ended up confusing the team there completely. Who was this fellow speaking broken French with a thick Congolese accent claiming to be an Australian? <laughs> Rick Ridgway, in recounting his journey across East Africa in the book Shadow of Kilimanjaro, writes, as I think back to some of my adventures, the ones that are most memorable are the, those that held surprises, the board experiences that were not anticipated or that revealed lessons that in advance were not considered. These are the true kinds of travel. The journey where the signposts are unfamiliar and new worlds you see reveal elements in yourself that you never knew existed. There was an unintended consequence to all of this, of course, and that's after I returned, I became aware of how much of a better listener I had become. I had to hang off every word, extract the syllables one by one, all effort focused on one thing, understanding what the patients were trying to tell me. When we practice in our native tongue, whatever that may be, I think our mind wanders to the next patient, the next discharge summary, the next clinic. It's a paradox I've not quite got my mind around, but I'm, I'm certain that it's real. I was better at listening because of practicing in another language. As many of you are aware, one of the joys and great privileges of medicine, canonised in the ethics of confidentiality, is to share a patient's story with them. In it often lies a diagnosis, and if not that, then certainly a way forward in treating them. So I hope the comparison with Heart of Darkness um, doesn't sound fatuous to you. There's a more serious side to it, of course. Heart of Darkness is fundamentally about a clash of cultures, dominant versus indigenous, in the middle of Africa. And I read the book again on returning home. It struck me that very little had changed in 100 years. In Betu in 2004, just as the Belgians had plundered the Congo, an Italian logging company was steadily grinding its way through the virgin forest there. We could actually see over the river to the Democratic Republic of Congo, which to the present day has its fabric torn by violence over its resources and its future shaped by powerful nations far beyond its own borders. The history of the region, when you read it, is a history that is written in tragedy. And for a young but relatively well-travelled Australian, this was a shattering reality for me that we had made so little progress to that land that Conrad had described over 100 years prior. And it cemented for me the widely held view that the devastating consequences of political failure are so often seen by the bedside, by us, the clinicians. So MSF had been in this place since the refugee crisis in the early 2000s, when 30,000 refugees had come down from the Central African Republic and DRC, been forced across the river into the French Congo, fleeing from the armies of Jean-Pierre Bemba, who you will be aware was most recently tried and convicted for war crimes by the International Criminal Court. And at that stage in 2004, the war had migrated across the other side of the DRC. Betu was peaceful and MSF was closing the mission after seven years. 
So you can Im imagine my sense of disappointment getting there. I was supposed to be saving Africa, not shutting it down. And there were supposed to be endless lines of grateful African children waiting for to be ministered my care. And instead what I found was a relatively functional hospital. An inpatient round in the morning, our patient clinic in the afternoon, not particularly cloud crowded and not a hint of the conflict that had caused the arrival of MSF seven years earlier. And so in retrospect, I'm glad. I don't know how I would have coped if high intensity clinical work uh, had also been combined with the culture and language shock that I was going through at the time. So there I was, the last doctor in the last team of the Betu mission. I was there to be the downsizer, the management consultant, the Mitt Romney of MSF. Um, and it was a real challenge for, to get my mind around that and realize that closing a mission effectively was as important as opening one. And if I can give you a little bit of a sense of the clinical work there, there was nothing more incredible than seeing a child near death from malaria in the morning and with a blood transfusion and artemisinin and combination derivatives sitting up in bed that night and discharged the next day. There was nothing more incredible than seeing a malnourished child stricken by tuberculosis, been discharged from the hospital two weeks later on successful treatment, um, ready to live um, a full and, uh, and prosperous life. These were the sort of clinical scenarios that I was seeing. And when I got back, when I was an advanced trainee some years later, my supervisor and mentor, George Kotsu in Royal North Shore in Sydney said he thought that it was a very arrogant sort of medicine, humanitarian medicine. And I have to say the use of that word shocked me a bit. I didn't really understand. But then I reflected on it and you get these powerful feelings that these kids are being cured because of you, because you're the doctor there, because you're making the diagnosis. It's nothing like that at all. Um, you've got three choices when you're in the middle of Africa. It's either malaria, pneumonia or meningitis. And you go through that sequence and you wait until the child gets better. And if they don't get better, you've got no chance of diagnosing it anyway because you don't have the tools to actually do it. So you're curing 98% of the patients you see, which is a sort of reverse equation from what we see in modern medicine in Australia. But it's not because of you as the doctor, it's because you are simply there as a doctor. It is entirely due to a resource limitation and the fact um, that you're there, the fact that MSF's there, is what allows those children to get the life-saving drugs that they need. And despite all the progress that we've made in modern medicine, malaria still remains the biggest infectious disease um, killer of children around the world. One of the other problems that we had to face up to um, was the effect that MSF has on the local population beneficial but also problematic. I told you that the Italian logging company um, was there in Betu. They were one major source of finance. And the other major source of finance was us. Um, so we really stimulated the economy. And when we left, we wanted to pay our staff according to French labour laws, which means that, pretty much like in Australia, you get a payout for the amount of service that you've given. There was a nurse called Jacques. He was one of the only guys that spoke English, broken English there, so he and I did a lot of communication. I gave him my MSF manual um, in English uh, when, when we left. Um, and uh, we found out, we gave Jacques the biggest payout, of course, and the Italian logging company hadn't paid their staff for about six months. No one had been paid except for MSF staff for about, about half a year. And so we closed the mission, we left, we made this enormous hole in the economy. We, we knew we were sort of doing all that and we couldn't do a lot about it. Um, we went down the river and when we got to Infondo after the 12 hour um, canoe trip back the other way, we got a call from the mission. Um, now remembering that we had downsized, we'd taken a hospital of about 40 staff, and what was, um, which was free, and what we left was a user pay system with one um, state um, employed doctor, one nurse and one pharmacist, that's all they had. So when we got down to Infondo, we get a call, and the call um, was telling us that Jacques had been murdered. Um, and the reason that Jacques had been murdered was because he was walking home one night, and the police, who knew that he'd um, worked for MSF, uh, knew that he would have a very large wad of cash in his pocket from us. Um, they stopped him, um, they asked for the money, he refused, they shot him. 
and there was no one there by the time he got to the hospital to save him, um, and he passed away. So I can tell you that, that I love MSF, um, but you can't glorify um, aid work. To do, to do good, there is inevitable damage. Um, what I think is valuable about MSF as an organisation is, is this constant grassroots reflection that we have. Everybody in MSF seems to have a voice um, through its association and the questions we ask, do we adhere to fundamental medical ethics? Can we truly say first, we do no harm? To be part of MSF is to engage in those questions and to hold those who make decisions within the organisation and more broadly to account. But it doesn't always go the way you want it to. I returned again to the field three years later to the West Darfur region of Sudan, this time as a project coordinator in a town called Zalinji, again swollen by refugees, this time 300,000, internally displaced um, from the civil war in Darfur. And there, there couldn't have been a starker contrast to my Betu and, and Chad missions. Security was very much an issue. Weekly assassinations would take place as the government tried to chop off the head of the rebel leadership within the refugee camps themselves. If you heard multiple AK-47 shots, someone was having a party. If you heard a single shot, someone was getting assassinated. Um, there was a curfew in place. The meetings with the local head of the government would usually end with him entering into some sort of fit of apoplexy and expelling one of the NGOs, so you never really knew whether that was going to be you. I remember distinctly um, coming down to one of the refugee camps and seeing some armed men in the distance. We, we swung around and, um, and nicked off, which you're actually not supposed to do because, curiously enough, an AK-47 bullet travels faster than a Land Cruiser troopy. Um, we did it nonetheless. Kidnappings were a real and present danger and were going on all the time. The climate was unforgiving, and it was incredibly hot, even for someone who's lived four years in Darwin, and relaxation was a complete impossibility. I'm not going to dwell heavily on my time in Darfur except to say that it was the toughest 18 weeks that I've ever been through. It's the character of MSF to put their volunteers into very challenging and unfamiliar situations. Um, but in contrast to the less acute challenges that I describe of Congo and Chad, this was one when I'd certainly reached my limits as an individual. I couldn't sleep. I started taking a few milligrams of diazepam in the evenings to try and snatch a few hours of respite and unconscious rest. I felt incredibly lonely. The position of field coordinator, essentially above your team, but with your superiors in the capital and in France is a very trying one because you have the responsibility for the well-being of your team in that very um, tenuous security environment. You have responsibility of decisions of how to deliver medical care, interacting with other NGOs, the local population and the local government. I was sitting in my office one day there when we heard an explosion come from the direction of the hospital. Um, we got a radio message soon after that that the Janjaweed had taken over the emergency room and weapons were present throughout the place and the team was sort of losing control over the, of the scene and, and feeling very unsafe indeed. I drove the troopy down into the back gate of the hospital, picked up the MSF expats and retreated to the safety of the office. Um, now I can tell you that there are tougher missions than Darfur was in 2007. It, it, in itself, it would have been uh, more difficult a matter of years prior. Mogadishu, when my successor Matt Cleary um, was there, or Angola, when my predecessor Rowan Gillies were there, both would have been more hot in terms of the conflict and security environment. But everyone has their own set point um, beyond which you exceed your capacity to cope, a sort of, I guess, mental health Peter principle. You elevate yourself to the point um, where, uh, where it becomes very, very difficult to manage. So around the four month mark, I was, actually, I was close to a wreck. I'd convinced myself that I had some sort of cardiac dysrhythmia. I returned to the capital Khartoum, actually got a halter monitor there, saw a cardiologist, left my team and the project to only two weeks before the end of my mission. But to this day, I consider that a failure, and it actually took me a good three years, um, I think, to come to terms with that. One of the clear consequences of pushing your limits in humanitarian medicine, whether it's in the heart of Darfur or the unforgiving crucible of medical training, is to be prepared to manage the effects on your emotional uh, and, and uh, personal well-being. Being a doctor and, and president of MSF, taught me that when we want to speak 
when we want to speak out or make a political statement, we have to do it from the patient's bedside or not at all. When we do that, we speak from a position of strength. When we exceed the mandate, um, then our words can mean very little and it's a fine balance. So I'm going to try to navigate that for you this morning um, by giving you my impressions about the state of health in Australia of our Indigenous um, population. And in doing so, I'm going to commit two sins. The first is to speak about anything to do with the Northern Territory through the prism of someone who no longer lives there. Um, I'm a Southerner, and being West Australian, believe me, I do understand parochialism. Um, but this takes on a new meaning in the Northern Territory, um, where I get the sense that the thoughts and opinions um, can be summarily dismissed if you don't continue to do your time there. Similarly, as we so often, as we so often hear, speaking about Indigenous um, health um, from a non-Indigenous perspective or someone as a relative newcomer um, could be thought of as a faux pas. So I need you to forgive me, I'm about to commit both sins. When I left uh, for my work overseas with MSF, a close friend of mine who was working in Alice Springs asked me openly why I didn't go um, to the Northern Territory, why I had to go overseas to help others and do my humanitarian care. Um, because there was an equal need here. And at that point, I didn't believe her. Um, how, how could she possibly compare the Congo and Darfur to the Northern Territory? Um, now, I don't particularly think that talking about third world conditions in Australia is always that helpful, mainly because it puts up some sort of barrier um, as if it's the third world and therefore not our country and we don't have to do anything about it. Um, but can I share with you that after four years working in the Northern Territory, I have seen some of the sickest people thus far in my career. I've met artists, community leaders, matriarchs of communities, and like the great Australian Dr. G. Unipingu, they are succumbing young to chronic disease, bronchiectasis, renal failure, heart disease. Dialysis is known as the countryman's curse in Arnhem Land. You know the statistic about closing the gap, the double decade difference between life expectancy for our indigenous Australians. That statistic is almost rendered meaningless until you see it with your own eyes. And unlike the diseases that I saw in the Congo, Chad and Darfur, these diseases are the most pernicious and insidious in type. Their origin is in poverty, education, lifestyle, and yes, in racism. One of the things I've got asked a lot when I've returned from overseas, having traveled as an Australian, do you think that Australia has a racism problem? And I tell this story. Two years after returning from the Congo, I read a French language newspaper with an article on a Pan-African music festival, which was actually held in Brazzaville, the capital of French Congo. And many different artists have been invited, including a group of pygmies from near Betu. The participants were housed in public, ha public buildings, police stations, schools, convents, that sort of thing. But the article focused on where the pygmies had been lodged uh, when they were invited to Brazzaville. In the zoo, because it was thought they would be more comfortable in their own environment. I saw a lot of racism overseas. I even fell victim of it myself a few times, but none quite as stark as people from the pygmy population of the Congo, very possibly the people that I had treated in Betu being housed in a zoo. It wasn't black and white, it was tall and short, it was racism. Um, nonetheless. So my answer to that question, does Australia have a racism problem, I say no more than others but also no less than others. What I think we do poorly as a nation is recognise instances of racism or acknowledge that it might permeate our institutions. It's such a loaded word, isn't it? Such a sharp accusation when it's levelled at someone that we would rather ignore it than confront it head on and admit that it may continue to be an issue that affects the health status of a significant portion of our own people. I've heard a lot um, since I've uh, worked in Darwin, a criticism levelled primarily in Indigenous but non -indi also non-Indigenous patients that some people do not engage with the health system or do not engage in their own health care. And I've got no concept of what people mean by that statement. It's our job as clinicians to help people navigate their illness, the health system. Many of you will have been consumers of healthcare in Australia, and it is a dauntingly complex system. The interaction between primary care, between hospitals, public and private, obtaining, following up investigations, all of the problems of a non-integrated, non-focused uh, healthcare system are magnified 100-fold when you're talking about a countryman uh, from the Arnhem Land or a matriarch of a community um, in, uh, in Central Australia. 
people where in, whose English language might be the second or third language that they know. Having learned and practiced medicine in a foreign tongue, I have an immense amount of empathy about how difficult it must be to be a patient in that scenario. And when I saw patients from remote community answer yes to every question or statement that I made, it reminded me only of myself in 2004 during handover from Dr. Kurtz when I just answered we oui to most things he said, having no idea what he really meant. And like the Congo of Joseph Conrad, the way we deliver healthcare to our indigenous patients is again about a clash of cultures, the dominant versus the indigenous. There's no doubt that the hardest clinical work I've done was over the past four years, from 2012 to 2016, trying to fit the square peg of Australia's health system into the round hole of an indigenous patient's need. It is incredibly difficult to go the extra mile that you need to for every patient. Um, the reality is that you can't, and sometimes the system wins. Uh, and I have nothing but the greatest of admiration, consider it a, a great privilege, to have worked alongside clinicians who have actually dedicated their entire lives to working in the top end of Australia um, and still do so. There are, of course, many more colleagues, some of whom you'll hear from at this convention throughout Queensland, Western Australia, and also the southern states, working in regional centres, Aboriginal medical services around Australia and across the country. I take my hat off to them. To conclude, I just want to tell you about a bit of a constraint that you have um, being a medical leader and working in the public system. Having been president of MSF and, and being able to speak freely and clearly on humanitarian issues, running the National Critical Care and Trauma Response Centre up in Darwin um, felt a little bit like blindfold shadow boxing with a hand tied behind my back. Um, and in our day-to-day -day work, we forget easily that we're actually in the public system beholden by the rules of the public service and are gagged from expressing views that would otherwise contradict the minister of the government of the day. But I take the view that the Hippocratic Oath um, uh, is stronger than the Public Service Employment and Management Act. You, we, have a duty to speak out against injustice from the bedside of your patients. And let me give you what may be a somewhat controversial example. Um, Senator Jim Molan was elected in the 2014 election and since then our Prime Minister Malcolm Turnbull has vociferously defended any attempt to point out that during um, what was in fact um, an illustrious career with the military, um, Senator Molan had command responsibility over the US forces in the battle um, for Fallujah and there was a huge um, bust up between the Greens and the, uh, uh, the government in the Senate earlier this year um, over Senator Molan's duty. But that sort of vociferous defence of duty um, is problematic and it speaks to a deification of military commanders purely by virtue of their being in service of a country, which to me um, is not a liberal democratic thing to do, it's, it's on the road to authoritarianism. The problem with Fallujah, of course, um, was the actions of the coalition forces with regard to Fallujah Hospital. Patients were forcibly removed from the hospital, staff were placed under arrest, it was closed down um, deliberately and protesters were shot in front of it. Um, for a cogent academic account, I would encourage you to read an article by a gentleman by the name of Chris Doran on Iraq and the case um, for an investigation of potential Australian breaches of the Geneva Conventions. And for the other side, um, a, a detailed account um, of the illustrious and um, impressive military career of Sen Senator Molan. Greg Sheridan writes a good piece in The Australian in February earlier this year. Um, there are two sides um, to this issue. Um, but it strikes me that for all of the targeting of healthcare facilities now by Russian, Syrian and Saudi forces in conflicts around the world, it's actually very sobering to think that the same thing happened over a decade ago um, with an Australian uh, second in command of those forces. And one of the reasons why this is close to my heart at the moment is that I have two friends working in Yemen um, for MSF. And you may be aware that despite MSF and other um, organisations supplying GPS coordinates of hospitals to warring parties um, over the past five years, across the Middle East, hospitals have been routinely targeted um, and uh, involved in the war, um, patients, um, doctors, nurses killed and uh, clear breaches of the Geneva Conventions occurring. Um, there is, in my mind, uh, a case on medical grounds alone for an Australian version of the Chilcot Inquiry into our involvement in the Iraq War. So as young leaders of the profession, you need a bit of a strategy to overcome um, this, this problem with speaking, this issue with speaking out. And I've already spoken to you about the importance and the power of doing it from the bedside. 
Um, but you also need networks and allies who know and trust your position. Um, ideally, you have a lot of them. You have people who understand and respect your stance on issues, even if they might not always agree with them. And we need creative and challenging ways of, uh, of challenging unfettered use of power. And the best example, by far and away, in the past five years was the actions um, of the paediatric doctors and nurses at the Lady Cilento Children's Hospital in present, preventing the discharge of an asylum seeker um, because uh, of the danger that they were going back into. But children are still in offshore detention. Um, our own government persists in implementing policy um, that, uh, at least on medical grounds, um, is, is unthinkable and unconscionable. So to conclude, is it necessary to do all of this from a position of leadership within the fraternity of the medical fraternity? Uh, and you will hear from a lot of great leaders at this convention and other, um, other things that you go to. But you don't all, no, not everybody has to do MSF, not everybody has to be a medical leader. Um, but there are ways that you can live your medical life true to the ethical principles of organisations like MSF um, true to the need to speak out against injustice on behalf of your patients. When you see inst instances of institutional racism within the country, um, when you see opportunities to improve the way that the system works um, for Indigenous Australia, um, I encourage you to take it. And in doing so, reflect on this final quote, which was um, by George Eliot, who, um, in testimony to how far we've come, um, would no longer in this day and age as a female author have to come up with a male name. Um, George Eliot said, the growing good of the world is partly dependent on unhistoric acts and things are not so ill with you and me as they might have been. It's half owing to the number who have lived faithfully a hidden life and rest in unvisited tombs. Thank you very much. Nick, thank you so much for your account of the realities of aid work. I certainly hadn't realised that it could be so um, kind of dangerous on the front lines. Have there ever been points where you genuinely feared for your own life? Yeah, I think there were, um, there were a couple. Um, when I was in Chad doing a vaccination project, I was taken away by the gendarmes who were, who, who were armed um, and uh, interviewed in... Um, in the local police station and I was wearing cargo pants at the time. It was one of the last days we were there and it was full of uh, chatty and currency to pay, um, the, um, uh, to pay the, our local um, staff who were working on the vaccination lines and they didn't realise it was there. If they knew that I was um, loaded with cash, I mean, you heard the story that I had about, um, about Jacques. Uh, so I think I was, um, I, I was fair to say, sweating it um, during that period. It was also the point where I realised that maybe I could speak French as I talked my way out of that one. Um, so, so the short answer is yes. But I, I, think, I think, you know, these are difficult things for us to comprehend, any of us who have never been in a situation where we've ever sort of feel, felt threatened like that. And I think it does take, your toll, uh, take its toll in terms of your own mental health. So how do you deal with the trauma that you witness and experience on MSF missions once you return home? Yeah, I think everyone finds their own way to deal with it. I think the organisation's got a responsibility to provide you with uh, counselling, and it does for free, but I think, it, you know, that organisational responsibility stops probably a little bit too soon, and I think any organisation, be it the military, be it MSF, has struggled um, with how to manage mental health in, in, their, in their staff. Um, for me, I've, I've never sort of got that, oh, I can't go into a shopping centre um, sort of agoraphobic type of feeling. Um, and in terms of dealing with it, I think it was, to be honest, it was just time in a lot of ways. Um, I, I mean, we, many of us are lucky to have very supportive families, um, people we can, we can talk to about it. Um, sometimes, though, you need someone who's experienced the same situation. There is a limit to how much someone who, who hasn't experienced what you've experienced is able. You, you can unload on them, but apart from, apart from the same sort of sympathetic ear that we all give to our patients when we really have no idea what they're going through, um, you, know, that, you don't get too much more out of someone who hasn't been there. On a broader note, what's been some of the highlights of your work? Yeah, um, thanks for that question because I, 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 do, um, I do tend to make that um, not deliberately dark, but to, to kind of emphasise that there's differing realities and perspectives of aid work. I mean, the, the 
far and away, it, it's an incredible experience. And um, as I said, the, the clinical experience of seeing people get better in front of your eyes, um, simply because you're there and able to, to give, give some care to them is, is a really powerful thing. The appreciation of families, the kid with glucose 6 dehydrogenase def deficiency, all we did was transport him to the capital, which couldn't do anything um, more than we could. Uh, but you know, somehow he got better along the way. Maybe it was the ride in the, in the aircraft, who knows? The parents were incredibly grateful. So you build up those powerful relationships. Also with the national staff, you've got to remember that in a lot of these dangerous places, um, the first people that are going to get evacuated are the expats, and the people that are going to have to stay behind are the national staff that work for MSF. Um, you know, in a lot of ways, they're the real heroes of the organisation because um, they're working for a humanitarian NGO in their own country, um, doing in their own country what I've just suggested we all do in our country. Well, you've certainly inspired a lot of the audience. How can people get involved with MSF and how can they be more involved with aid work at this stage in their degrees? So I think it's just a, a consciousness um, that it's a path that's available to you. It's not right for everybody and it shouldn't be right for everybody. There's a lot of ways, I think, you know, I hope what you got out of that was that there's a lot of different ways that you can advocate for patients, take a stand on issues. One of the best things I've seen is the amount of posters that AMPS has got at the moment on the different advocacy points. So that, that's the first thing to say. But the direct answer to the question is um, you've got to have two years of postgraduate experience. Uh, it is preferable to speak French because you get a wider choice of missions, although you, you, know, you should actually speak French. Um, the, um, if you do rural health uh, in Australia, if you practice in Indigenous um, uh, community, and it, you really also need to have travelled overseas. The main thing that they don't want is for them to sort of you know, canoe you in and then have to helicopter you out. Um, so all those things will, would hold you in good stead for MSF and probably most of the other international NGOs. Excellent. Do we have any questions from the audience? If you do, just stick your hand up and we'll throw one of our robots. I really want to see one of those thrown mics. <laughs> so even if you don't have a question, just put your hand up. <laughs> all right, Got one, one from down there. Yeah. Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, um, I was just wondering what sort of uh, specialisations or training, oh, sorry, uh, what sort of specialisations or training programs would be the most useful for uh, aid work and things like that? Um, there, are a, there are a few that sort of stand out. Uh, I think the first answer to that question is probably um, pick the specialty that you love and um, then find the route to um, satisfy your need for um, aid work or advocacy through that particular specialty. Um, and, you know, what don't we see too much of? Um, I was going to say palliative care, but that's not true. That's sort of an emerging um, subspecialty. I mean, you're not going to be a cardiologist in, uh, in Darfur, really. Um, so um, it's emergency medicine, um, OBS and gynae, surgery, paediatrics. They'll all have a sort of role. Um, there's two different types of mission for MSF. There's a general mission where you're actually best um, in your PGY3 year, probably, because you're closest to all your medical school training. And then there's very sub-specialised missions. Um, so it does, it does cater widely, um, but again, um, work, work out what floats your boat first and, uh, and, and then do the humanitarian work second. Excellent. Do we have any more audience questions? Well, there's one right at the back there. This might be quite a throw. That's going to, yeah, that's going <laughs> to. We might need the second box. That's going to be like that guy in the World Cup who can throw <laughs> into the box. <laughs> I, I can, yep. Yeah, um, so uh, I think you're entirely responsible for all aspects of their health, including their mental health. How much it's foregrounded now in field coordinator training, I must say it's um, been a decade, 11 years since I was field coordinator. It wasn't that foregrounded when I did the field coordinator training, and I think um, MSF's had to come a long way uh, in, you know, 
say it's not about a, a teaspoon of concrete and toughen up. Um, it's, there, there's actually serious issues here. But um, you know, people get evacuated for mental health reasons, as I did. Um, did I think that anyone in the organ organisation realised that I was, I was um, stressed and um, essentially was having some form of, of uh, traumatic stress disorder? No, I don't think they realised it. Well, the last question comes from a slightly different angle. It's how do we address the government's ban on medical practitioners reporting the happenings now detention centres? Yeah. Um, so I, I, I don't think um, I'm terribly good at this. I've just um, had a chat to my uncle who was a big anti-war activist in, uh, the, um, in the 1960s and 70s about this very question. It's about some sort of sustained response and strategy. The problem with a lot of protest in these days of 24-hour news cycles and Twitter and that sort of thing is that the sort of you know, extended pressure that can be exerted upon a government um, just doesn't seem to be there. It's these sort of flashes in the pan. Um, so I think if an organisation like AMSA were um, to, to exert some sustained pressure, um, you know, is there, is there an opportunity to do some occupying of people's um, government offices and stuff like that? I don't know. That's what they were doing in the 60s and 70s. That's what the civil rights movement had to do. Um, so, you, you know, take a, take a very strategic approach and then know what you're trying to achieve. Are you just trying to achieve people talking about it? Are you trying to achieve um, repealing the legislation? And once you know what you're trying to get to, um, then have something that's actually going to, uh, is, is not just these sort of acute things that you're doing, but has a, a much more sustained approach. Fantastic. So thank you so much, Nick. That's been, without a doubt, the most interesting global health lecture I've ever received. Um, can we please give Nick a warm round of applause? <laughs>